Hello, dear listeners. Welcome back to another enlightening episode of Eureka Moments, the podcast where we explore the wonders of science and the universe. I'm your host, Gerd Danny, the director of Free Astro Science. Today, we're turning our gaze upward to a familiar yet ever mysterious celestial companion, the moon. Have you ever wondered why the moon changes shape night after night? Why sometimes it's a glowing crescent hanging delicately in the sky, and other times it's a full, luminous orb? Well, buckle up, because today we're unveiling the secrets behind the moon's phases and the intricate celestial dance between the Earth, the moon, and the sun. First things first, let's set the stage. The moon is Earth's only natural satellite orbiting our planet at an average distance of about 384,400 kilometers. It takes approximately 27.3 days for the moon to complete one orbit around the Earth, a period known as a sidereal month. But interestingly, the phases of the moon are based on a synodic month, which is about 29.5 days. This difference occurs because while the moon is orbiting Earth, Earth itself is orbiting the sun, causing the moon to take a bit longer to catch up. So, what causes the moon's phases? It's all about the interplay of sunlight and the positions of the Earth and moon. The moon doesn't produce its own light, instead, it reflects sunlight. As it orbits Earth, different portions of its surface are illuminated from our perspective, creating the phases we observe. Let's break down the main phases. 1. New Moon the moon is positioned between the Earth and the sun. The side of the moon facing Earth receives no direct sunlight, making it nearly invisible in the night sky. 2. Waxing crescent. A sliver of the moon becomes visible as it moves eastward, with a growing fraction of its surface illuminated. 3. First quarter. Half of the moon's surface facing Earth is illuminated. It's called first quarter because the moon is a quarter of the way through its orbit. 4. Waxing gibbous. More than half of the moon is illuminated and it's approaching fullness. 5. Full moon. The earth is between the sun and the moon, and the moon's face is fully illuminated as seen from earth. 6. Waning gibbous. The illuminated portion starts to decrease after the full moon. 7. Last quarter. Again, Half of the moon is illuminated, but now the opposite half compared to the first quarter. 8. Waning crescent. The moon returns to a thin crescent before the cycle repeats with the new moon. Isn't it fascinating how this cycle is so precise and predictable? But wait, there's more. Let's delve deeper into some intriguing phenomena related to the moon's phases. Have you heard of a blue moon? Contrary to what the name suggests, the moon doesn't turn blue. A blue moon refers to the second full moon occurring within a single calendar month. This happens because the lunar cycle is about 29.5 days, and our calendar months vary between 28 to 31 days. And what about a supermoon? This is when a full moon coincides with the moon's closest approach to Earth in its elliptical orbit, called perigee. The result is a larger and brighter appearance of the moon from our perspective. According to NASA, a supermoon can appear up to 14% larger and 30% brighter than a typical full moon. Now, let's touch on lunar eclipses. A lunar eclipse occurs when the Earth comes between the sun and the moon, and Earth's shadow falls on the moon. This can only happen during a full moon. During a total lunar eclipse, the moon can take on a reddish way, often called a blood moon, due to Rayleigh scattering the same effect that causes red sunsets. Understanding the moon's phases isn't just about satisfying our curiosity. It has practical implications, too. For centuries, farmers have used lunar calendars to plan agricultural activities. The tides, influenced by the gravitational pull of the moon, affect marine navigation and ecosystems. Even in modern times, the moon continues to influence culture, religion, and art. Speaking of modern times, let's talk about recent lunar exploration. In 2023, NASA's Artemis program made significant strides toward returning humans to the moon. Artemis I was an uncrewed mission that successfully tested the Orion spacecraft and space launch system rocket. 
The upcoming Artemis II mission, slated for 2024, aims to carry astronauts around the moon, setting the stage for a lunar landing with Artemis III. These missions are not just about planting flags and leaving footprints. They're about establishing sustainable exploration by the end of the decade. This includes building the Lunar Gateway, a space station orbiting the moon, which will serve as a staging point for lunar surface missions and potentially missions to Mars. But why are we so eager to go back to the moon? The moon holds valuable resources like water ice and permanently shadowed craters at its poles. This water can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, potentially used for fuel and life support systems. The moon also offers a unique platform for scientific research, from astronomy to geology helping us understand not just the moon itself, but also the early history of our solar system. Isn't it awe-inspiring to think that the same moon our ancestors gazed upon is now within our reach again? The phases of the moon that guided ancient civilizations are the same markers we're using to plan interplanetary exploration. Now, let's address some misconceptions. A common one is that the moon's phases are caused by Earth's shadow falling on the moon. This is not true except during a lunar eclipse. The phases are actually due to our perspective of the illuminated half of the moon as it orbits Earth. Another interesting point is tidal locking. Did you know that we always see the same side of the moon? This is because the moon is tidally locked with Earth, meaning its rotational period matches its orbital period around Earth. The far side of the moon remained unseen until spacecraft photographed it. Before we wrap up, let's consider how observing the moon can be a gateway to science for everyone. With just your eyes, you can track the moon's phases over a month. If you have binoculars or a small telescope, you can explore lunar features like craters, maria, and highlands. And for our tech-savvy listeners, there are numerous apps and websites that provide real-time data on the moon's phase, position, and rise and set times based on your location. This makes moon gazing more accessible than ever. As we conclude today's episode, I hope you've gained a deeper appreciation for the moon and its phases. It's more than just a celestial body, it's a cornerstone of our natural world, affecting tides, ecosystems, and even our calendars. Remember, the next time you look up at the night sky and see that glowing orb, you're witnessing a cosmic dance that's been ongoing for billions of years. Thank you for joining me on this lunar journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Eureka Moments and visit freeastroscience.com for more fascinating insights into the universe. Until next time, keep exploring and stay curious.